An empire in ruins. No industry to speak of. Enemies everywhere. And an army ready to fight. Only in spirit and soul. Welcome to another episode of Ottomans in World War I. I'm your host, John Baljolu. In our previous episode, we mentioned how the Ottoman Empire was lured into war on the side of the Germans, and the story of two famous ships, Goeben and Breslau, which became Yavuz and Midilli. In this episode, we will try to give you a general picture of the Ottoman army effectiveness and readiness for the war. We will also talk about the life in the Ottoman Empire, in Istanbul and in other parts of the country. We will also mention the military leadership of the country, both German and Turkish officers. The Ottoman Empire had huge contrasts in terms of lifestyle and the condition of the people that lived there. Istanbul in itself had huge differences. For example, if you would go to the Pera district, you would see electric lights, tramways, and the first ever tunnel train ever built in the world. Mustafa Kemal Pasha at that time would spend days in this beautiful district. But if you would just cross the Galata Bridge, you would walk into Fatih, where you would see the remnants of a middle-aged empire. This contrast affected the people of the Ottoman Empire significantly. Istanbul was economically and socially very different from the rest of the empire. Again, when you look at Mustafa Kemal's memoirs, when he traveled to the east, he found that the people over there had no link to the Ottoman mainland. At that time, he realized that the Ottoman Empire was at the brink of collapse, not only as a political entity, but also as a cultural structure. People of the Ottoman Empire were poor. There was no industry to speak of. Some factories were established, but uh, they were established by the foreigners. Nowadays, a lot of historians accuse the Europeans of being imperialists and taking advantage of the resources of the Ottoman Empire. The German military mission was also supported by the German economic mission. The always East policy that we've mentioned in our previous episode shows us that the Germans were trying to establish a railroad all the way from Baghdad to Berlin as a sign of German technical superiority. This gave some advantages to the Ottomans, but without an industry and no goods to carry, the railroads were insignificant. The Ottoman Empire, although a vast empire with a huge landmass, didn't have many resources for its own people. Food was scarce, farming was weak, and even the most basic illnesses would cause death for many citizens. Now this is a picture of the Ottoman Empire in 1914. And if you were careful enough to watch our first episode, you would remember that a lot of people migrated from the Balkans after the Balkan War. The stockpiles of food, as if there were any, were left for these people to consume it along with the people that lived in these areas. So bottom line is, the country, in terms of its lack of industry, and lack of uh, necessary agricultural means was not ready for a war. What about the Ottoman army? Well, with an empire that didn't have any industry and didn't have proper agricultural means, the army suffered a lot. If the empire was not economically ready for the war, well, obviously the armed forces were not either. The Ottoman armies had just suffered from a massive defeat in the Balkan Wars, as we mentioned in our first episode. Modern weapons that were supplied by the Germans were either lost and some of them had to be replaced. The German military mission, along with the railroad connections all the way to Germany and Austria-Hungary, tried to bring more artillery pieces, guns, bullets, machine guns, but these were not enough. Now, in order to have a general understanding of the Ottoman armed forces, let's look at how they were positioned. The majority of Ottoman divisions were located in areas where they expected an attack from their enemies. Russia, the natural enemy of the Ottoman Empire, forced the Third Army to be located in the east, which would later take part in operations in Sarukamish under the direct command of Emir Pasha. Around Damascus and uh, facing the Suez Canal, there were four divisions. Three divisions were protecting the Basra Front. And in the west, four divisions, leftovers of the Balkan Wars, were located in Thrace. Six divisions were in Istanbul in order to provide flexibility in case of an attack to the Gallipoli Peninsula. And they were also one division near Smyrna in case there was a landing. Now, when we say divisions, we're talking about Ottoman military divisions, not European-style military divisions. This means that the Ottomans were not properly supplied, 
their field kitchens were working at uh, nominal levels, and their arms were not as modern as the European arms. Mauser, the Mauser rifle that the Germans supplied in their military mission to the Ottomans, became a whole trademark for the Ottoman infantrymen, also known as Mehmetchik. An effective military division has to have artillery support, logistical support, and also observation methods. Otherwise, it cannot mount any warfare. Due to the lack of resources, the Ottoman armies were always positioned with the, anything that they could find. But in 1910, right before the Balkan Wars, there was a huge reform in the Ottoman armies. As we mentioned in the first episode, Enver Pasha managed to replace some of the old and unknowledgeable and ignorant Pashas with young officers such as Mustafa Kemal. In that same reform, according to Mr. Erickson's book, there were many changes in the structural system of conscription. Of course, political intrigue continued even after the Balkan Wars, and this would go on for many years to come. Of course, I don't want to give a pessimistic view. Some people would take it as a way of trying to humiliate the Ottoman armed forces. Actually, it's exactly the opposite. What the Ottoman soldiers lacked in technical means, in logistic means and weapons, they covered for their bravery and their strong spirit and their conviction to fighting. Gallipoli was a great example of this. Also, fire discipline was commended by all enemies of the Ottoman Empire. A very interesting uh, example that we're going to be able to have more details on is during the Gallipoli campaign on April 25th, when Australian soldiers landed on the beaches of Gallipoli, they thought that the Turks had machine guns because the fire discipline was superb. And the Ottoman soldiers knew that if they did not defend their fronts, they could not defend their homes. Therefore, every single observer around the world realized that the Turkish soldier was a brave and strong soldier. Self-sacrifice was another important aspect. Now, we mentioned how the Ottoman armies were and how effective they are. And in the description area, you can have detailed maps and detailed information, uh, which we cannot cover in this episode. In order to see the status of the Ottoman Empire, it's good to compare them to their European contemporaries. Now, this map that you're seeing right now is a railroad system all the way from Germany to Austria-Hungary, through Bulgaria, and eventually to the Ottoman Empire. The railroad network would determine the winners and the losers of the First World War. And in this map, you can see the railroad network within Germany. An interesting information, in 1917, when the Russians left the war, Germans managed to move one and a half million troops from the east to the west in 15 days. This was extraordinary. Of course, the Ottomans didn't have that kind of an infrastructure. And uh, compared to other European powers, the fronts were very far away from the central resources. Also, when you look at the industry of Germany, Austria-Hungary, France, England, and even Italy, you can see the difference. One thing the Ottomans had in common with other European powers, especially Austria-Hungary, is that the number of minorities. This, of course, caused many problems. All the way from conscripting these people who may not actually want to fight for their sultan or their king, to the fact that if there is a major defeat, they could always turn to the other side. In that case, the Ottoman Empire and Austria-Hungary were brothers in fate. Also, a little interesting trivia. The railroad network was so important that it actually determined the result of the Gallipoli campaign. When Bulgaria joined the Central Powers in 1915, the Allies realized that there would be more big Berta guns, as you can see in this photograph, coming to Gallipoli. These guns could also uh, threaten the already battered Allied Navy. Therefore, one of the major decisions that the Allies took in order to evacuate Gallipoli was the connection that the Ottomans had to Central Europe through railways. Of course, one cannot ignore the figures, the heroes, or the characters within the Ottoman Empire, especially in its high command. One such individual was Field Marshal Levan von Sanders. Now, this German gentleman was appointed to be the commander of the uh, Turkish forces in Gallipoli. Now, you would imagine that in order to command such a critical post, you need to have some experience. This man was a cavalry officer, thus, and he also never knew what trench warfare or tactics and strategies were about. So God knows what the German high command was thinking when they literally dumped him on the Ottoman Empire. Another German individual was Admiral Sushon. As we've mentioned in our previous episode, he was the commander of the German ship SMS Goben, which ended up being Yavuz. 
Now, when you buy a ship, do you also buy the captain? Uh, I don't think so. But in this case, they bought him too. And he ended up doing the military operations that got the Ottoman Empire into the war. Also, we have to mention some other individuals that are not German. One of them, of course, is Enver Pasha. We already mentioned that he was very pro-German. And he tried to do his own Schlieffen plan by trying to capture the Russian forces in Sarukamish from behind, not realizing that his troops would freeze in the mountains of Allahu Akbar in minus zero conditions. The hero of Edirne soon became the disastrous commander of Sarukamish, where 90,000 Turkish troops died. We will talk more about him in our future episodes. Another individual was Jamal Pasha, who would end up attacking Suez many times with the Ottoman soldiers. Although his troops managed to cross the desert in very bad weather conditions, they were unprotected against the heavily fortified Suez Canal. Now, another individual that we cannot ignore, probably someone that is very significant for modern Turks right now, is Mustafa Kemal Pasha. Mustafa Kemal was a young military officer. He and his friends had French military books and philosophy books in their lockers. Of course, because of the political situation of the army, these books were prohibited. But during long nights, they would sit down around the candle fire and try to figure out how to modernize and save their empire. A man that had to travel to different fronts of the empire in order to protect it. He saw that the fall of the Ottoman Empire had a lot to do with the economic situation, the backwardness of the people, the fundamentalist approach. And he knew all the way from his military days that he would find a solution. Of course, he was going to be the star in Gallipoli and would lead on a modern secular nation in the future. Mustafa Kemal's adventures in the First World War would be one of the main points that we will be covering in this series. Now, before we close, I'd like to remind you once again that we need your support on Patreon and also follow us on our social media channels. We would also like to give you some important updates. We will soon be selling our own merchandise where you can have some memorabilia of the Ottoman Empire and First World War. Please share our channel, subscribe and enjoy our videos. I'm John Baljul, your host, and you've just watched another great episode of Ottomans in World War One.